Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we are going to talk about opposites and one of the core Jungian dictums about holding the tension of the opposites. And what Jung says is the opposites are the ineradicable and indispensable preconditions of all psychic life. And that is an example of Jung's uh, late in life thinking. And what he was doing was expressing the dynamism, the energy of the psyche in terms of the first law of thermodynamics, which states that energy demands two opposing forces. So we're going to explore today how the opposites appear, how they work, and what it really means to hold the tension. One listener of the podcast uh, told me that that the phrase has kind of become a meme because we use yeah. it so frequently on the yeah. podcast. So I know if, if you're a listener, you, you hear us talking all the time about holding the tension of the opposites and, and how that's a virtue. But I, I think it's especially important in our current, uh, this kind of current, current moment in the culture. Well, let's begin for a moment around the discovery of the idea of the opposites. Because it was not a common way of thinking about human consciousness or the structure of the psyche. But one of the places that Jung was inspired came from his work with Gnosticism. That particularly in the cosmology of the Gnostics, God gives birth to the Son, S-O-N, and then as the mind of the Son organizes itself, it creates pairs of thoughts that are organized in these complementary couples. And the Gnostics had their own way of naming these pairs of opposites. But what was important is they were seen as an essential matrix of creation, the creation of psyche at the very least, and as part of a cosmology the creation of the universe. And in their story of the fall and redemption, one of the pairs of opposites split apart, which then tumbles one thing into matter while another thing remains in the celestial realms. And the entire mythopoetic narrative is the restoration of the relationship between the part that's in heaven and the part that's now become lost in the senses and in matter. And that archetypal theme was so compelling, and it helped Jung imagine something that he was sensing in himself and his clients 
and it finally became a central corollary of our work. Yeah, it's wonderful to ground it in this uh, ancient philosophy because that that was a big influence on Jung. And I think it is kind of a, a truth that the opposites are the engine for all psychic energy, in fact. Uh, you know, Heraclitus uh, said that uh, war is the father of all things. And Jung quotes Heraclitus in this regard that it's these warring pairs of opposites that give birth to ideas, to energies, to desires. I, I'm thinking about it meteorologically, that our weather systems operate in terms of opposites. So you get a cold front and a warm front. And the juxtaposition of these two things creates wind, and it creates rain, and it creates movement. And it's very much like the, that in the psyche as well. And the new birth or the new thing in the psyche uh, that comes out of holding the tension of the opposites and allowing them to really energetically work on one another is, is something that is called the symbol. And it is a non-rational new thing that comes about. It's not something you thought up. And it will arise out of psyche, oftentimes uh, as a dream or an image, uh, such as, let's say, uh, the orphan or the abandoned child. And that's the new thing. Neither one nor the other, but a non-rational knowing that emerges as a symbol. I'm thinking a little bit about what this means for us. I mean, these are these are all very big ideas that we're talking about. But, but I'm thinking that when we talk about the need to hold the tension of the opposites, you, and it's such a kind of funny phrase in a way, but it is, it is the kind of thing that sometimes when I say it to clients, I can see this, oh, okay, I get that. And it's letting two opposite things be true for you at the same time and not needing to resolve it one way or the other. So one of the developmental examples of that is at some point in a reasonably normal childhood, a kid will discern that they both love and hate their parents. And when they're able to have that revelatory moment of feeling both emotions simultaneously, it stops them in their tracks. It's in one way highly confusing but it also creates a sense of relief in the individual because loving and hating somebody allows you to stay in a relationship with them, neither being merged nor constantly in conflict. We might not language it that way to ourselves, but I think if we do a bit of thinking around it, we can all remember a moment or examples of navigating that both and at a level of feeling. One of the ways that I think the tension of the opposites has become widely accepted without languaging it quite that way is the tension between thinking and feeling and intuition and sensation. How many times have any of us that do therapy had clients come in and say, oh, my husband, he just never talks about feelings or he doesn't monitor the feelings that the kids have. The feelings aren't, aren't working here. There's not enough clarity around it or I don't have enough you know, feeling returning from my spouse. And what we'll discern is this woman might be a feeling type. Her husband might be a thinking type. That's part of the original spark that made it seem exciting to date and eventually become a couple. But over time, what we're seeing is that the opposite function is calling to the complainant, is beating a drum and asking for attention, not just in the spouse, but asking for attention in the complainant. So there's a lot of workshops where people are 
strongly encouraged to identify and express feelings. So all of us over the many decades have probably gone to any number of retreats or workshops where people are asking you to get in touch with your feelings, learning to find language about it, breaking into a dyad and discussing it. Or at some point we were asked to draw a picture of our feeling and then to analyze how that was actually representative of something that we weren't aware of. So because we live in a culture that has a natural preference for thinking, often on a larger scale, will generate opportunities for people to both identify and get language around feeling. And yet, my friends who work in academic institutions also discover young people who come to college very emotionally charged, full of a lot of opinions and even a lot of kind of physical dynamism. And as they discover the power of their own intellect, a kind of balance can come into them, that they can think about their feelings, that they can enjoy a kind of internalized cosmology that a philosophy of one fort or another can provide for us. And that bringing in the thing that we're missing can actually make us more dynamic. You know, I'm thinking about the relationship of this idea of holding the tension of the opposites with the idea of paradox, uh, which Jung wrote a fair bit about, by the way. But but if part of it is allowing these two opposite things to be true at the same time, I mean, that is that is kind of the definition of paradox. And Jung said of paradox that uh, it's a better witness to truth than a one-sided so-called positive statement. He also said that paradox is the natural medium for expressing transconscious facts. And finally, he said that paradox was one of our most valued spiritual possessions. And all of this, I think, goes to the truth that psychic facts or, or really any facts of real significance are too complex to be expressed in plain, straightforward, positive statements, that any real truth with a capital T will be paradoxical. And the thing is that we do a violence to that truth and to our own psyches to side with one, uh, with one side of the paradox versus the other. So we have to let them both be. And I want to share a quote here from Jung that talks about this for a second. It's a bit longer. He says, the ego keeps its integrity only if it does not identify with one of the opposites and if it understands how to hold the balance between them. This is possible only if it remains conscious of both at once. However, the necessary insight is made exceedingly difficult, not by one's social and political leaders alone, but also by one's religious mentors. They all want decision in favor of one thing, and therefore the utter identification of the individual with the necessarily one-sided truth, in quotes. Even if it were still a question of some great truth, identification with it would still be a catastrophe as it would arrest all further spiritual development. So there's a lot in that quote, and one of the things is his reference to to social, political, and religious leaders. Because often things in religious life, in uh, out in the social world, or in political life, tend to do exactly what he's guarding against here, what he's warning us against, is there's one truth, and the other side, the opposite, is something that we must discard. And the irony is, over time, the discarded attitude grows in power and potency. And before we know it, we are behaving as if we are aligned with the thing that we have finished. So we can see this tragically. Some people who can become, let's say, anti-war advocates can become so fiercely possessed by it 
that they will do violence to other people and actually become warriors as they are advocating for the transcendence of violence. And that goes to Jung's idea of enantiodromia, which he took from Heraclitus, of how one thing actually becomes the other. It's a different image from the pendulum swinging back and forth, but that in selecting one side, as you've said, Joseph, that one side and uh, real zeal and adherence to, let's say, anti-war, be- becomes an embattled attitude about, let's say, pacifism. And, and we can become zealots. We can become warriors in, in the quest for peace. Yeah, so we, we become that which we fight against in a way because we've taken this hard, one-sided position. I have a personal story about this, actually. When I was in my 20s, I, I lived and worked in Washington, D.C., and at one point I was actually dating a lawyer who worked for the ACLU, which I thought was just really super cool at the time. And I remember sitting and talking with him and a couple of his friends in a bar. And I don't remember how we got there, but they referenced the fact that the ACLU uh, routinely will represent the KKK. And there was this really famous um, example in 1977. There were some neo-Nazis who wanted to march through Skokie, Illinois, And in Skokie, one out of every six Jewish residents had survived the Holocaust or was directly related to a survivor. And so the town of Skokie denied the neo-Nazis gathering and the neo-Nazis appealed to the ACLU and the ACLU took the case and won, upholding the right of these neo-Nazis to protest and to have freedom of speech. So these guys were were talking about this with me over a beer, and I was, you know, shocked and horrified. I was like, "Wait, the ACLU was was I? I don't understand. What do you What do you mean they were, you know, they were uh, defending the KKK or neo Nazis? Like, how could that be? I just didn't. I was I was absolutely flummoxed. You know, I was probably twenty five years old, and I, I just couldn't understand it. They explained it to me with great pride that that is uh, the meaning of freedom of speech, is I may disagree with what you say, but I will fight for your right to say it. And, you know, in that second, I sort of got it, like how important it is that uh, you, you can make room even for something that seems so abhorrent, because that is this principle of freedom of speech, which I think is actually a kind of oper- operationalized example of holding the tension of opposites. And so much about the opposites has to do with attitude. It has to do with a kind of psychological splitting. Because many of the things that we think of opposites in the physical world are actually polarities of a spectrum. For instance, we could easily say that hot and cold are opposites, but actually they're simply a spectrum of temperature and it discerns how much energy or lack of energy a certain substance has making it hotter or colder. So when we focus on the polarity, they seem to be against each other, but there is a uniting theory that puts them in a relationship to each other. Jung was interested in discovering or noticing the revelation of the line upon which polarities lay. And when we can discern even a glimpse of that, we tend to feel an enormous sense of relief because then we can tread a single path from the extremes or between the extremes which gives us a sense of control and choice. I think what I would like to add is how very difficult it can be to hold the opposites, the paradox, the full range of the spectrum, when it's an issue that we feel emotionally passionate about 
You know, it's one thing to say hot and cold is a spectrum of temperature. They're not really opposites. And it's another thing to think about a moral issue, let's say. Yeah, like the one I, I raised, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like exactly. Nazi. Like, what? And when they're coming to your town. And there, there's a lot in public life today around political parties, uh, Supreme Court decisions about uh, Roe v. Wade, and, and many, many other things where people are passionate that this is right and that is wrong. And then it becomes a real challenge to hold the opposites rather than let one side predominate uh, and we feel better of good. Uh, That's done. I'm right. And it seems to relieve the tension. Deb, you're bringing up a couple of different things. First of all, I'm aware that there is uh, some research that a plurality of opinion will usually result in a better outcome. So in other words, if you have, let's say, staff working together in an agency and uh, some of them are conservative and some of them are kind of middle of the road and others are quite on the left end of things, that getting them all together and sitting them down in a room trying to solve a problem together, you will likely have a better, more creative, more thorough solution if you have that plurality of voices. But in order to do that, you have to make room for everyone to speak, even though the person sitting across the table from you may have a viewpoint that you find untenable. I think there's something about democracy that requires us to do this holding of the tension of the opposites, not to label the other guy as wrong or bad or so execrable that uh, his viewpoint can't even be heard. We, we have to be willing to sit with something that feels really wrong to us because there might just be, you know, this much uh, truth in it, you know, and it makes sense, right? Because w- when we get locked into a certain worldview, of course, that that's going to be limited. Of course, there's going to be something we don't see. Of course, we all have blind spots. It doesn't matter where you sit on the spectrum politically. You have a blind spot. So does your opponent. And that's why the bringing together of it, you know, it's sort of like the political version of the transcendent function, that when you can sit with the discord and you can sit with the opposites and you can tolerate that, something better emerges. So, so there's, there's something here, Deb, you know, that, that you're lifting up that makes me want to say, well, th- we're talking about something that's an important principle for democracy to function. It's very, very hard. Uh, we, I think we see our kids uh, wrestle with the, the powerful feelings that come up. So to function in a democracy and to allow the plurality of voices and to sit with that requires a tremendous ability uh, to hold emotion. And, and that is the key ingredient of holding the tension of the opposites. Of I've believed all my life that X or Y is right and Z is wrong. Of to sit and listen to whatever Z might be is asking a lot. Yeah. And yet I think as we look out into our collective and the the many many levels of strife, the importance and the value and the need for holding that tension is greater now than I can ever remember it being. It costs us. Well, it creates an enormous amount of unconscious tension in the individual and in the collective. And that tension marauds and makes all of us much more vulnerable to psychic infections being swept up into often irrational causes. It can actually create a cycle of enormous oppressive behaviors 
in order to constantly protect oneself against the idea that cannot be tolerated. And then sadly, individuals want to institutionalize value systems that disallow open discourse or the presence of ideas that might threaten the establishment. And the entire culture is hobbled when that kind of oppressive value system is permitted. I'm wondering if it would be helpful to take this out of the kind of social political realm for a second and to put it into a clinical example. And so I, I want to share a, a story that happened in my practice, and I'm, I'm going to be altering the details substantially to protect the person's uh, privacy, but she did give me permission to share this story. So there was a, a woman in my practice who was very sophisticated. She was a therapist herself, and she had married into a family uh, from a Latin American country, and they were they were a large clan-like family, and they were very wealthy. And they had, um, you know, certain ideas about who they were and who they wanted their kids to marry. And she had married their oldest son. So she had sort of married the crown prince. And she was, she was not Latin American. She was not Catholic. Uh, she was um, sort of not what they would have picked. They were nice enough in the beginning, but as the years wore on, her in-laws started kind of lobbying against her. So a couple years into the marriage, at this point, the, the couple already had uh, two children. There was actually sort of pressure from the in-laws for him to, to leave her. And she was, of course, very, very upset about this. And her husband was too. I mean, he he loved her and he was very committed to her. And she um, came into session one day and told me that her husband had understood that he would need to end the relationship with his parents because he felt like he was being given a choice between choosing his parents or choosing her. And, you know, this really upset her because, you know, she did not want to be the fulcrum upon which that decision turned. And so um, we agreed that he would uh, come with her to the next session. And, you know, what we were able to do in that session was really to sort of frame this as the need to hold the tension of the opposites. So rather than seeing it as I need to choose between my wife and my parents, sort of, well, all of these people are hurting and upset. And uh, I can hold both of those things. And so that just created just a way to think about this, that, that this, this, uh, this young man had to kind of just hold everything. Not sort of not, you don't have to do anything right now. You can just hold this. And then furthermore, uh, in, in sitting with them, they, they came up with a really good sort of plan going forward which was to uh, limit visits with the family in a certain in a certain way. So there were, I think they they decided that there would be um, you know kind of time limitations on the amount that they spent with the family, and that they would they would only see kind of members of the family for a little while, just kind of one on one, because things were just so much worse when it was the whole group. And and so there was a kind of practical way to go forward with this. And it, it did turn out that following this path allowed uh, tempers to cool and for things to shift and uh, kind of stabilized the relationships and no relationships had to be ended as a result. So I think that that's sort of a, a little vignette that shows what this can look like in life. And I'm aware that going to the great common denominator of feeling uh, is what enabled uh, the husband in particular to hold that tension the, of his love for his parents and uh, siblings, his love for his wife, his anguish that this difficult situation had transpired, uh, the grief. 
that he had to hold all those feelings rather than who was right and who was wrong. To stay with the emotions rather than going to content about whose opinion is really right. And we do that all the time. We go up into our heads and go into what masquerades as a thinking function or as morality. Uh, And there is another real uh, pit that people fall into of what is right. Go to the feelings. Go to the feelings. What is your emotional process about this? Well, it seems to me like we're we're back in this realm that we've been before on the podcast in projection and shadow. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes what happens when we identify with one of the pairs of the opposites, with one polarity of it, is the other one falls into shadow and then we project it out there. So we, we are back in this very important work of kind of addressing and integrating shadow. And a lot of times what we have a strong feeling about and, oh, they must be wrong. It's like, okay, well, where is that in us? Where's the shadow in us? And and so a really common example of that is somebody discovers their sexuality for the first time in their lives. And then they begin to project onto other people a kind of conservative prudery. So other people are all just prudes and I'm really and I'm really sexually liberated. Or conversely, somebody has integrated an extremely conservative, chaste, austere attitude around their own sexuality. Their libidinousness, their eroticism gets locked in the unconscious, and then they find themselves accusing all kinds of people of being sexually inappropriate or somehow dangerous or dark because their sexuality is kind of out of control. In fact, that happens so frequently that we barely pay attention to it. That particular kind of splitting that happens around sexuality. One easy key around this is to preference the word and, A-N-D, because It's okay to have a conscious attitude, not that anybody needs permission for that, but it's inevitable because the waking personality has to create some kind of a frame by which to evaluate all the multiple choices that we have in any given moment. But when I begin to think about language that allows me to define myself, the discipline would could look like, well, I am a highly sexually liberated or sex positive person. I really welcome all of that adventurousness. And sometimes I really just want to be alone and unto myself. That I don't always want to be seen as a sexual object, nor do I always want to perceive other people in sexualized terms. Sometimes I want to know who I am away from all of that. And we can have this and feeling that we can have both. And in fact, we need both at least a little bit of the opposite in some form that we can imagine or put a toe in so that we have a sense of balance. I wonder if... Going back uh, to the example you gave, Lisa, of the neo-Nazis marching in Skokie, whether that really means I oppose this point of view, I do not agree with it, and there is a place in me that has a a rigid Nazi-like attitude. Uh, And for Jung, Jung would say that that was the case, that we have inner brutality, we have inner transgressive stuff going on in us all the time, and that to acknowledge that in ourselves is not the same as enacting it, and in fact, it provides a kind of inoculation against enacting it. 
But if we're one-sided and we really think we're, we're good and, and proper and pure, we're self-deceived. I think one of the things that can make it difficult for people is that they're not mutable around their language of the opposite. So, for instance, if we were to use the example of, of the Nazi, you know, the outer fascist versus the inner fascist, we often have a kind of trigger word that we've landed on, which maintains the split between however the personality experiences itself and the intolerable thing. But if we could drop down to a more conceptual level, somebody who is uh, a great believer in democracy, for instance, and in the respect for each person in the community, well, they're, they're not going to be able to look inside themselves and say, well, where is my inner Nazi? But they might be able to look inside themselves and say, well, where is the part of me that's intolerant? Where is the part of me that wants everyone to see it my way? Where is the part of me that only feels safe when I have an enormous amount of power and control over the people and factors around me? So if we drop down into a more neutral, conceptual way of thinking of the opposite, then we can often tolerate finding little threads of values really are quite different from how we think of ourselves consciously. So one of the things that Jung puts forward is that the reality of the opposites, whether or not we're conscious of them, provides the engine of consciousness. That without the dynamism of the opposites, that we would not be able to function, that we would fall into a kind of psychological torpor. So that's, a, that's an interesting thing for him to say. So one way to understand that, which was helpful to me, if I imagine that one half of my brain is the conscious personality and another half is the unconscious, which is purely symbolic, by the way, I can imagine that every time some clever new idea pops into my awareness that the opposite of that idea simultaneously awakens in the unconscious mind, maybe not with as much detail even, but at the very least a kind of nodal point. If we think about this as a kind of old-fashioned scale, that you know there's a bar with two little plates dangling off of it, and that whatever is put on one plate requires some kind of a counterweight on the other side in order for us to stay connected to reality. If something were to violate that balancing process, we would become so consumed by our self-created theories that we would soon lose our functionality because we would be so alienated from what is actually happening in the environment. So we can all think of times when we may have, maybe it was childhood or when we were quite young, believed in something that was absurd. And had we continued to believe it and formulated choices around that absurdity, we would have put our safety or worse at risk. Or at the very least, embarrassed ourselves greatly. It seems to me that what we're talking about is the capacity to tolerate conflict. That it's not, we're talking about the opposites. But what happens when it stirs up uh, such conflict inside, inside us? And challenges, you know, like you were saying, a belief that we had when we were children and, you know, that, that I believed, let's say, you know, that, that my father was just always right. And what happens when I have to face that conflict that he's a human being? He's not right all the time about everything. And uh, it's a huge internal conflict. 
and in a way, we really have to be able to sustain a, a kind of uh, inner battleground at times so that these two opposing forces can really have it out with one another. And Jung talks about it as the old story of the hammer and the anvil. And that is how consciousness gets created. Yes. That it's in this battle, it's in suffering this tension of the opposites that we become more conscious. It's not in identifying with one pole or the other. It's in staying in the conflict. You know, there's this uh, somewhat chilling quote, perhaps even more chilling this week than it would have been a couple of weeks ago. This is from Barbara Hanna, Jung, His Life and Work. Some years after the Second World War, Jung was asked if he thought that there would be an atomic war. And he replied that he thought it depended on how many people could stand the tension of the opposites in themselves. So this is a personal work that we're advocating doing. It's not, uh, you know, going out there and, and marching. It's doing inner work to hold the tension of the opposites. Jung believed that that inner work, so the work that we do uh, when we work on our dreams or the work that we do in the analyst consulting room could help prevent a nuclear war. And there is a really radical idea. So relative to that profound idea and the current events, for people to find in themselves both war and peace simultaneously, that there is something in all human beings that crave both. And to find examples of that in our own feelings, our own thinking, our own behavior, and perhaps even in our spirituality, so that we can be ruthlessly honest with ourselves at the very least. And if we can find the war in our soul, the places of war in our lives, then we have some capacity for holding that as an internal energy. And when we hold it as an internal energy, we give it space to live in the inner worlds so that it doesn't have to invade the outer world. So as we move into the dream today, I just want to remind all of our listeners about Dream School. Dream School is our online program that teaches you how you can do this transformative work with your dreams. So check it out on our website, thisunionlife.com, and you can read about Dream School. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, as you know, my book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, was published in May of 2021 by Sounds True. And since it's been published, I've been feeling most excited and grateful reading the reviews for the book on Amazon and Goodreads. It makes me realize that this journey, which began as a challenging personal inquiry for me, has become a real healing force for many. Motherhood won the Parenting and Family category of the Best Book Awards this year through the American Book Fest, which has been exciting too. But what really feels nourishing to me as an author is hearing what's happening on the ground in people's hearts. And so many people have written to me on email or on social media and let me know how much the book has meant to them. And there's just nothing more gratifying than that, than to hear that the book has meant so much to so many people. So Motherhood is available wherever books are sold in paperback, ebook, and audio formats. And I hope everyone who's meant to dive into the well of its lessons can do so. And I so appreciate hearing from people what they think of it. So keep the emails and the letters and the comments coming. I, they mean a lot to me. There's also a free course that's related to the book and a book excerpt on my author website, which is lisamarciano.com. And I encourage all of our listeners to check it out. So thank you for asking, Joseph. I'm just uh, so happy 
for you and it's such a lovely lovely book both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother it's never been written about it hasn't been out there and it's getting such an enthusiastic heartfelt reception it's wonderful yeah i would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers, but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. Mm -hmm. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. And that speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Tessa. The analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be missed <laughs> as having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. That's mm. right. Today's dream comes from a, a woman who's 30 years old and is a mental health worker. I dreamt I had a little bird, like a cockatoo or something, who was my friend. He would press his head into my face to warn me of floods and bad storms. I hadn't seen him for a while. I was at the cousin's house in America and was reunited with my bird. We were affectionately putting our faces on each other when he stopped and pressed his head into my cheek for a really long time. I took this as a warning of a huge flood or storm. The house had a big safe room and everyone went there. I realized that the furniture in my bedroom, in my own house that I share with my boyfriend, except for a very pastel version, wasn't secured and threatened the integrity of the safe room. I ran to fix this. There was a time limit. A curtain would close and a door would shut, leaving me locked in the bedroom if I didn't get out quickly enough. The room was tilting up, and to tidy bits away, I had to climb the bed, which was hard to get purchase on, and up the chest of drawers, which had all the drawers pulled out like stairs. Time was running out. On my way down the bed, I decided to close the drawers to stop the contents coming out. As I finished, the time ran out and the door shut. I was locked in the bedroom alone to weather this huge storm without any provisions or comfort. I wished my bird was with me but I was also glad that he was safe. And for context, she notes, I found out three days prior to the stream that my mother has cancer of the liver, and this is the fourth time she has been diagnosed with a cancer. The main feelings in the dream were joy at being with my bird, then terror, frustration with myself, desperation, and grief. She says, I've never owned birds or experienced flooding, but did read a book featuring them, which I finished the day before my mom got her diagnosis. We live in the UK, and my American family is my mom's brother and his children. They lived in England until 2001, and we were close growing up. I spoke to my cousin earlier in the week for her birthday. This is one of those dreams uh, where my first reaction is to the feeling. And uh, there is something incredibly sad and very, very moving about this dream. And I think it's important to recognize when there is such a powerful feeling um, that, that in a way that is a primary part of the story of this dream. Where I find myself curious is the decision that the furniture in her bedroom was the pivotal problem. And maybe it was, you know, the dream ego's assessment of the situation must often be held in suspicion because the dream ego often doesn't have the full information uh, to make a decision. But sometimes it's right, so it's sometimes difficult. So the furniture in her bedroom wasn't secured and threatened the integrity of the safe room. So secure and integrity and safety 
are kind of floating around as this uh, peripatia. I mean, this is really almost like the climax of this first act of the dream. You know, what's the thing that the hero or the heroine does that then changes the action and then leads to this outcome of her being locked away from safety? So I, I'm wondering very much about what that means. Yeah, that's that is that is a an important point to interrogate is what about the furniture in that room and that that's the room that she inhabits now with with her boyfriend and what was the nature of the danger that it posed to the safe room you know and and of course you know there's almost a sort of existential question is is there anything is there any safe room that could save her from the storm that's coming and you know i think probably not right but the good news is she has an inner companion that is charmingly imaged as as a bird which i i am somewhat partial to because i i have a pet bird and <laughs> they they can be wonderful companions but it's a beautiful image of the way that the psyche shows up for us when we're in distress i mean it's almost like a fairy tale to have this animal that's so loving and knows something that the ego doesn't know and can communicate it to the ego. And it feels so important to me that the bird is going to be safe, that the dreamer knows that the bird will be safe, that bird is in the safe room. Paradoxically, the function of the bird, who is friendly and charming, is to warn her of floods and bad storms. And flooding is often an image for emotion. That we, and we say that all the time, just in common parlance of, oh, I was flooded with feeling, or this feeling just flooded over me. A and the bird warns her about floods and bad storms. You know, there's, an, there's another element of this dream, and that is time. And I noticed that even though it's a fairly short dream, the word time was mentioned three times. And there is the sense of, you know, time's running out and, and I have to hurry. And uh, then that's it. Time's up. And when we're dealing with such a serious illness and someone that we really love, there is a, an acute awareness of time and how time may be running out. I also want to offer a, a personal story for this dreamer, which is dreams have a way of preparing us for what is to come. Just like the little cockatoo, the dream acts like the cockatoo. The dream warns us so that we can prepare ourselves psychically. My mother was very ill for years and years and years. And then it was clear that the end was coming. I mean, it was going to be a matter of days. And I was uh, preparing to go and, and be with her. And I had a dream. Of course, I was paying attention to my dreams. And I had a dream. I don't remember the details right now, but it was something like I was going on a long trip to a place I'd never been before. And I arrived at the airport and I didn't have the things I needed. Something fairly mundane, a dream... I've had dreams like that many other times. They're not uncommon dreams. And, you know, because I was <laughs> in such a state, I uh, looked at the dream fairly literally and was like, well, what do I need to think? What do I need to bring? <laughs> like, really, that's where my head went. Wow. But of course, you know, my, my mother did die a few days after I had that dream. And after she passed away, I realized that the dream was saying, Lisa, you're about to go to a new realm that you've never been to before. And the dream was just a gentle reminder to, to prepare myself for that. So I think this, this dream is, is, is giving you a loving warning about what is to come. When I think about these existential realities, the eventual death of our parents, our own decline as we age, that we can find the birds of foresight to let us know that these things are likely to happen, just as our cockatoo does. 
But as much as we prioritize safety and security, there will come a moment where we cannot defend against reality and that there are no provisions or comforts that can mediate the full impact of various experiences or truths. And just as Lisa said, there are images here which are trying to prepare the ego and the psyche to have a direct encounter with the storm that may yet hit. I would like to say also that the dream is not telling you that this will be terrible. The dream is, is suggesting a storm is coming. Some storms allow life to surge afterwards. Some storms wipe away things that are old and broken and useless and have to go. The storm in the biblical story of Noah allowed the psycho-spiritual world to be reformed in a new way after the old things had been washed away. Storms are complicated symbols, but something is often left in their wake that is the foundation of the new life. I agree with what you just said, Joseph. And in the dream, uh, there is a fear of a big storm, but the dream itself does not say that a big storm actually occurred, uh, that the bird warns her of, of floods and storms. Uh, she took it as a warning, and then she's locked in the bedroom alone to weather this huge storm. Well, that's the dream ego's fear, is that it's going to be cataclysmic. The dream itself does not say this, and the dream ends with, her bird is safe. Her intuitive, kind of spiritual, special companion who comes to tell her things, it's like a fairy tale. That part is safe. It's still there. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.